The words saint, sanctify, and holy all come from the same root word. It means to be set apart and made holy. So the Holy Spirit sets us apart. So the essence of that word sanctify means to be set apart and made holy. So this is what happened in your salvation. God the Father chose you. God the Holy Spirit came, and this is the way I would lay it out. He came to convict you and to convince you of your sin and to draw you to Jesus Christ. You didn't come to him out of anything other than the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus, the Holy Spirit convicting you and convincing you that you are a sinner in need of a savior. What a blessing thing that is. We're gonna look at verses one to five tonight. The title of my message is Celebration of Salvation. I hope and pray that you'll come every week as we go through this amazing first epistle of Peter. We'll go into second Peter as well. But I want to just read one verse to get us started in verse 1 of chapter 1. It starts with Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Someone said that Paul was the apostle of faith, that John was the apostle of love, but that Peter was the apostle of hope. I love that. And it's really that theme that Peter picks up in this first epistle, the hope that we have, the hope even in suffering, the hope even in sorrows, the hope even in our trials. So Peter is the apostle of hope, and I want to look at three things in this first verse. First, the writer or the human author is listed right off the bat, Peter. Now, who doesn't like Peter? We love Peter. Every time the list of the apostles are given in the Bible, Guess who's on the top of the list? Good old Peter. And Peter was an apostle of Jesus Christ 210 times in the New Testament, more than any of the other apostles or disciples is the name Peter found in the scriptures. Now his name Peter means rock, and it's taken from the Greek. And Jesus, when he called Peter, took Simon, who is the name he was born with, which is Hebrew, which means listen. And he changed his name to Cephas or to Peter. Cephas is the Aramaic of the Peter, which is Greek. So when you read about Simon, when you read about Simon Peter, when you read about Cephas, you're reading about the apostle Peter. And what a wonderful apostle he was. He was called by the Lord in an interesting situation where he is brother Andrew, and Andrew the apostle was his brother. And Andrew came to him and says, we found the Messiah, and he brings him to Jesus. And Jesus changed his name and called him to follow him. But Peter also was a man who had a couple of unique situations where Jesus turned to Peter, and he said to Peter, Peter, Satan has desired to sift you as the wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when you are converted or turned, strengthen your brothers. So he says, Satan desires to have you. Can you imagine Jesus turning to you and saying, the devil asked for you. He wants to sift you as wheat. And you're thinking, what'd you tell him, Lord? What'd you tell him? <laughs> Told him, no, right? He can't have me. But I love it that Jesus said, I've prayed for you. You know, Jesus is the right hand of God the Father right now. And you know what he's doing up in heaven? Praying for you, praying for me. That when Satan comes and tries to attack us and sift us as wheat, that our faith fail not. But he said to Peter, when thou art converted or turned back, strengthen your brethren. I love that. And that's what Peter's doing in this epistle. He's writing to strengthen us in grace of God, to strengthen us to stand in the grace of God. And then there's that other episode after the resurrection when Peter had denied the Lord three times. And Jesus met with Peter in the post-resurrection appearance. He said, Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And said, well, then feed my sheep. And he said again, Peter, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said, feed my sheep. 
And then a third time he asked him. And Peter was grieved that the Lord would ask him three times. He denied him thrice, and he affirmed his love for him thrice. He said, Peter, do you love me? He says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then Jesus said, feed my sheep. Peter was one of the great, great apostles who in this epistle, and his second epistle as well, was feeding the sheep. You know what it means to pastor? It means to feed. It's the word shepherd. And the shepherd's primary job is to feed the sheep who are the people of God. So in this epistle, we're going to be encouraged and strengthened by Peter himself, who is commissioned to feed the sheep and to strengthen the brethren. So what a blessing this epistle, I believe, will be. Now, the recipients are mentioned for us in verse 1. He's called an apostle, Peter is, of Jesus Christ. He's one sent and commissioned. And he's writing to these, the strangers scattered throughout. And then he names the regions, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now that area, by the way, is modern Turkey. In the Bible days, it was known as Asia Minor. But in today's uh, uh, map, it's, it's a picture of there. It's in the position of Turkey. So these were strangers scattered. Note those two words in your Bible, verse 1. That means that they were resident aliens. Scattered means that they were of the diaspora. We get our word seed from that word. So they were scattered. Now, we don't know if they were primarily Jewish or Gentile, and it doesn't really matter. It's probably a mixture of the both. But early church was made up of a lot of Jews. And many times the Jews were those who were part of what was called the diaspora. We get our word scattering seed from that. And because of the persecution, they were scattered out of the Holy Land. And they were in this area known as Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So they were in this area which was primarily Gentile territory. Now notice also thirdly that Peter's purpose in the letter was because they were strangers, because they were scattered, they were also suffering persecution. First Peter, if you don't get anything else I say in this quick little introduction, was written to suffering Christians. So there's a lot of great information in this epistle to encourage us, to strengthen us, to stand in the face of persecution and opposition, and trials and testings and suffering. If you want to know how to stand in trials and suffering, get your Bible open and turn to 1 Peter. I want to point out a couple of references. Look at verse 6 of chapter 1. He says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, which is trials or testings. So Peter says, we are rejoicing right now and this little season when we are going through heaviness and manifold trials or testing. So Peter is writing to strengthen them during this time. Look at chapter 4 real quick for just a moment. And verse 12, I just can't wait to get to chapter 4. It's my favorite section on encouraging people through suffering. Peter says, Beloved, when you suffer, remember God loves you. Think it not strange, which means foreign or odd, concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm resisting expounding on this verse right now because it's so packed, but we'll get there in several weeks. But what a marvelous thing, he says, we rejoice at this time of suffering and heaviness, even though we're in trials and testings. So it's been normal for Christians to suffer throughout all church history. We living in America at this time, kind of a rarity and an oddity. The tide is turning and we are becoming more persecuted in even America. But the majority of Christians around the world are suffering right now because they're Christians. Many of them are actually being martyred and imprisoned for their faith in Jesus Christ. 
So we need to remember those that are in bonds is bound with them and pray for them. And we need to also strengthen ourselves for the persecution that could come indeed, even in our own beloved United States of America. What a sad and tragic thing that is. So Peter was writing to help those who were suffering to stand in the face of opposition. And look at chapter 5 and verse 12. This is one of the key, if not the key texts to understanding the book of 1 Peter. In chapter 5 and verse 12, he says, I have written briefly, so he's explaining why he's writing, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God, and here's the theme, wherein you stand. So Peter, Peter tells us why he wrote his first epistle. I wrote and testified that this is God's grace, and this is what causes us to stand during this time. Now, he was writing perhaps from Rome. At the end of the book in chapter 5, verse 13, he mentions Babylon. And again, we can't be certain, but some, a lot of Bible scholars believe that that was kind of a code name for Rome. And he was writing from Rome to the area of Asia Minor. But he was writing to encourage them to stand in God's grace, chapter 5 and verse 12. Now, just a quick outline of the whole book. He teaches us in this book to stand in our salvation in chapter 1, verse 1 to chapter 2, verse 10. Then secondly, we'll be looking at, he teaches us to stand in submission, chapter 2, verse 11 to chapter 3, verse 12. And then thirdly, he teaches us to stand in our suffering in chapter 3, verse 13 to chapter 5, verse 11. Peter starts with the subject of salvation even in his introduction or salutation in this epistle. Now, as does with Paul in his Pauline epistles, this is what's called the general epistle. He starts with doctrine. He starts with doctrine. You've heard it said a million times, but doctrine always precedes duty. Principles always come before practice. A lot of preaching today is on practical Christian living but without a doctrinal foundation for how to live as a Christian. If you follow sequentially the way the scriptures are laid out, before we're exhorted to live the Christian life, we are given a doctrinal theological foundation for who we are in Christ and its solid foundation so that we can live out our Christian life. So doctrine always comes before duty. Our principles come before practice. As you believe, so you behave. And you need to understand the Christian life before you can live the Christian life. It doesn't do a lot of good to exhort people to live as a Christian when they don't know what a Christian is. Or they don't understand who Jesus is or what their salvation invo involves. So we're going to look at two things as Peter wants us to stand in this section tonight, verses 1 to 5. Two aspects of our salvation as we celebrate salvation. Standing in our Election, verse 2, and then standing in our salvation's hope, verse 3 down to verse 5. Now, first thing we want to do is we want to understand our calling as being elect of God, verse 2. Look at it with me. Peter says that salvation involves that you are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then he wishes them grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So there's his greeting or salutation in verses 1 and verse 2. So notice, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Peter gives us three reasons to celebrate. I'm going to try to keep it as I best I can, simple. Now, I can't explain the doctrine of election so that it'll be all clear in your mind or resolved in your heart, but I do believe that clearly the Bible teaches this truth, that if you are a Christian, God chose you. You did not choose him. You go, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Didn't I repent and believe in Jesus? Yes. 
Didn't ask Jesus to come into my heart? Yes. But Jesus said, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. You say, well, I don't understand that. Welcome to the club. <laughs> I don't understand it either. And here's what the problem quite, quite often is. When you try to reconcile the issue, you're going to do damage to one or both of those doctrines. Human freedom, man's free will to believe and to repent and trust in Jesus Christ, and I believe that he can resist the grace of God, and God's divine elective purpose. You will never be able, this side of heaven, to perfectly reconcile these two issues. But I do believe that we should accept <clears throat> the fact that election is indeed a doctrine found in scriptures. Now, <clears throat> not to get into this theological debate, but there's two general categories that people fall into. One's Arminian, Arminianism, and the other one is Calvinism. And they take on one side or the other, and they camp on one side or the other. The Arminianist emphasizes human responsibility and man's free will, and they de-emphasize the elective purposes of God. The Calvinism emphasizes, and I think many times overly so, the sovereignty of God, the choice of God, the elective purposes of God. And I'm not a really in either one of these camps completely. I think there's truth and error in each one. But I think that whenever we come to scriptures that teach a doctrine, that we should just accept them as being biblical and that they reconcile in a higher unity. How, how do you explain the hypostatic union that Jesus was both fully man and fully God, but only one person? How do you, how do you, how do you, how do you reconcile that? You can't. How do you reconcile the Bible was written by man, verse 1, Peter, but it's the word of God that they spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit, that the word of God is God breathed. So it's a, got a, a human nature and a divine nature. We can't. So we accept the fact that God reconciles that in a higher unity. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says that God chose us before the foundations of the world. How do we understand that? All we do is accept that. I like what Warren Warsby said. He says, if you try to explain election away, you lose your salvation. If you try to not explain it away, or you try to reject it completely, then you, you lose, if you try to, excuse me, if you try to understand it, then you lose your mind. And some people are about ready to lose their brains, lose their minds, over this issue. And by the way, both camps or categories are within the realm of orthodoxy. That means they're brothers in Christ and we should love one another and accept one another as brothers in Christ. But notice this breakdown of this verse. Verse 2. God the Father chose you, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now the the term foreknowledge, I happen to believe, means not God's omniscience or that God knows everything, but it means that God set his love upon you. It's consistent with the idea of God predestinating and electing and foreknowing. Predestination is the truth that God determines those who he elects and chooses will end up in heaven. He predetermines before we are even saved in time what he will do with those who come to Christ, those who he elects. And then he foreknows us in eternity past and that he sets his love upon us. Have you ever just had a thought of why me? Why did God save me? Why did he open my heart and open my eyes? Why did he give me his Holy Spirit? Why did he forgive my sins? You might have a brother, sister, or a family member that has rejected Christ, has rejected the gospel. And God reaches down and just saves you. I know my wife, when she first got saved, 
she didn't come out of a Christian family and her parents weren't Christian or her only sibling or sister was not a Christian. But God just reached down and saved her. I'm glad He did. She's been my faithful wife for 46 years. Mother of my children and grandchildren. But the thought that God would just reach down and save us by His grace. So that strengthens us in our sorrow and our suffering and our hardships to think that I've been chosen by God. Remember when you were in maybe elementary school and you'd go out on the playground to have recess and they would pick, up te- pick out teams and they get a captain, two captains? Some of you are starting to freak out thinking about that. <laughs> Bad memories. And you were maybe not very athletic or very skilled on the softball field or whatever sport it was. And You knew that you were going to be the last one chosen. And you didn't even get chosen. They just said, okay, we'll take them. They'll come on over here. And they put you in right field and tell you to stand way back in the corner. And if the ball comes, just don't move. Somebody else will get it. (laughs) And you always feel so rejected to think that God, the God of all the universe, would choose me for salvation. It's more than I can fathom or comprehend. And I don't believe that he chose us based on a foreknowledge concept of he looked ahead in his omniscience and time and knew who it was who would repent and believe in him, and then he chose you because that would actually completely negate the doctrine of election. It would be God choosing you based on your choice of him. And election is, I believe, God's sovereign, free grace. And I, again, can't comprehend that or understand that, But again, I'm not going to resist it or fight it. I'm just going to be thankful that God has saved me by his marvelous grace. So we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He set his love upon us. That's God the Father chose us. And then notice, secondly, we have God the Spirit has been uh, uh, set as a part, verse 2. So we are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, And then that happened through the sanctification of the Spirit. And I believe that's the Holy Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then the salutation of grace and peace be multiplied unto you. So God the Father chose us. God the Spirit sanctified us. Now the word sanctification of the Spirit... The word saint, sanctify, and holy all come from the same root word. It means to be set apart and made holy. So the Holy Spirit sets us apart. So the essence of that word sanctify means to be set apart and made holy. So this is what happened in your salvation. God the Father chose you. God the Holy Spirit came And this is the way I would lay it out. He came to convict you and to convince you of your sin and to draw you to Jesus Christ. You didn't come to him out of anything other than the Holy Spirit drawing you to Jesus. The Holy Spirit convicting you and convincing you that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. What a blessing thing that is. So the Holy Spirit's involved in your salvation. He draws you to Christ. He convicts you. And then when you believe in Jesus Christ, when you repent and you believe in Christ or trust in Christ or accept Christ, I'm fine with that term, or invite Christ to forgive your sins and come into your heart, the Holy Spirit regenerates you. Now, the Calvinists would say this, and this is one of the points I disagree with Calvinism, and that is that they believe because we are in trespasses and sins, that we don't have the ability to seek God. And I, 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 I agree with that. But I don't think that the, the, the concept of being dead in sin means that we can't resist the grace of God or choose to accept or reject Jesus Christ. The etymology of the word dead literally means separation. That's what the word dead actually means. When you die physically, you leave your body. When our dear brother James, yesterday afternoon, died, he didn't die in that he ceased to exist. 
he went out of his body and went to be with the Lord. Amen? That's why the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So I just believe that that dead in trespasses and sin, it means that we're separated from God. Have we been completely, fall, are we fallen? Yes. Are we unregenerate? Yes. But the Calvinist teaches this. They teach that the sinner must be regenerated, given spiritual life, in order to believe in Jesus Christ, and that the faith in believing in Christ is a gift from God. And I don't believe that that's clearly taught in the Bible. I believe that what happens is the moment you believe, you are born again or regenerated. Now, that word regenerate, and we're going to get the concept of the rebirth in our text, literally means to be born again. We, we know and use and understand the word born again. But the theological term is regeneration. It means to be made alive, quickened, made alive, given new life. Now, I do believe that God chooses us. We don't choose him. That the Spirit convicts us and draws us. And if you're saved, it's all of God. Salvation is the work of God. But if you reject Jesus Christ, you are to blame. You are responsible. Again, don't ask me how to reconcile that. I can't. But I believe that that's what's taught in the Bible. But I don't believe that regeneration precedes faith. I believe it happens the moment you believe in Christ, you are quickened or made alive, and you're indwelt. So those are different works of the Holy Spirit, which is mentioned here. He convicts of sin, he converts or regenerates, and he indwells the believer. And you become a believer the moment you're regenerated and you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And once that happens, I believe that you are eternally secure and that you will end up in heaven. We're going to see that implied tonight in the text. That what begins with grace will end in glory. Because the Holy Spirit not only convicts, regenerates, indwells, but he seals you until the day of redemption. And that sealing of the Holy Spirit speaks of not only ownership, but it speaks of security. If you just even just simply understood the doctrine of the sealing of the Spirit, which every believer has, you would understand how safe and secure you are in the hands of Jesus. So we are saved or chosen by God the Father. We are sanctified by God the Holy Spirit. And then here's the third facet of our elective salvation. God the Son died for me. So in eternity past, God the Father elected me. In time, the Holy Spirit convicted, converted, and dwelt, regenerated, sealed me. And then also, in history past, Jesus died for me on the cross. Go back with me to verse 2. And he mentions the sprinkling of the blood of, Christ, of Jesus Christ. The sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, or the obedience of the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a reference to the cross of Christ. If you want to get to heaven, you can't go around the cross, right? The only way to get to heaven is through the cross of Jesus Christ. The NIV renders verse 2 for obedience to Jesus Christ. So we must believe, and we must trust, and put our faith in Christ. Right now in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13 it says, God hath from the beginning chosen you, there it is, to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. 2 Thessalonians 2.13. You ought to write that down, look it up, meditate on it. All these points are found in that one text. So Jesus becomes the object of our faith. Our faith is in Jesus Christ who died for us on the cross. So we have the sprinkling of the blood of Christ. We are forgiven by God's grace. And again, verse 2, we experience his peace. Now we move to the second section, verses 3 to 5, and we are to stand in salvation's hope. 
So we have the elective purpose of God choosing us, saving us by His grace, and what it does is bring to us hope. Let's read it, verse 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father. This is a eulogy of worship and thanksgiving and praise to God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. That's that, that's that idea of being regenerated or born again. Unto a, here it is, living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fades not away. And notice this word in verse 4. Reserved in heaven for you. Who are kept, verse 5, Verse 5, kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, write down these three blessings that come to us through our salvation. Number one, we have a living hope. We have a living hope. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy, God's mercy is abundant. God's mercy is new every morning. And through his great mercy, he has begotten us. We've been born again to a living hope. And it's by and through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the living Savior, brings to us a living hope. Now, this list could be quite long, but this is the living hope we have. We have the hope that we've been pardoned from our sins. We have the hope that we have his presence in our lives. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So he becomes an abiding presence in your heart and life, never to leave you, never to forsake you. And then thirdly, we have his power, right? When you become a child of God and you're born again and you're regenerated, you now have the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life of holiness and true godliness. And then we also will have his pattern in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a pattern of ours? He's the prototype. You know that Jesus Christ is the first one to ever come out of the grave in a eternal, immortal body. He's called the first fruits of those who sleep. What a great, great hope that is. This is why Easter gets me so pumped. It's so awesome to celebrate Easter. Not the chocolate eggs, no Easter bunny, but the resurrection of Jesus. All our hopes are on Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When you lay your loved ones in the ground and your heart is broken and you say goodbye, They're only sleeping. They're waiting the resurrection. And just as Jesus rose from the dead, our bodies will be quickened and risen from the dead as well. What a glorious prospect that is. So we have a living hope. Then fourth, or excuse me, secondly, in verse 4, we have a heavenly hope. I like this. To an inheritance, incorruptible, undefiled, fades not away, And I'm so glad it's reserved in heaven for me. It's reserved in heaven for you. Our salvation guarantees heaven. And again, what a blessing it is when that reality hits you to realize I'm going to go to heaven. What a blessing to realize that. I'm going to go to heaven. I believe not only in the doctrine of the security of true believers, but I believe also in the assurance that a believer should have of their security and salvation. If you're not sure you're going to heaven, something's wrong. You're not believing God or trusting God or resting in his promises. If you're not accepting the truth of God's word and assurance, I am going to go to heaven, and then you can face even death with the courage that you will be resurrected and meet Christ in the air. Now, the moment you die, 
you're with the Lord, but you're there in what's called the intermediate state, waiting for the resurrection of the body, to be reunited with the soul and spirit, and then forever with the Lord. What a blessing that will be. So we have a living hope, and then we have a heavenly hope. Our salvation, verse 4, guarantees. Notice the word reserved. Have you ever been traveling, come to the hotel, and they say, yeah, may I help you? Yes, my name's John Miller, and they start talking to John Miller. Do you have a reservation? Yeah, I have a reservation. Give me your restaurant. Give me, give me your conference. They start typing. They're typing. And they go, sorry, Mr. Miller. We, we don't have any record of you having reservations. And you just kind of for a moment say, Lord, help me not to lose my sanctification. <laughs> or you go to rent a car and you book a car and you set up a car. And then they say they don't have your name. They don't have you set up. You're not reserved. And you have a confirmation number. How upsetting that is. Can you imagine getting to heaven? And you walk into the gates, and they go, what's your name? John Miller. <laughs> Sorry, Mr. Miller. I have no, we have no reservations for you. But I was a pastor. Oh, too bad. Freak out, right? I'm so glad that there's a name written in heaven and that I have a reservation and it's reserved for me, kept by the power of God. It's a sure hope. So we have a living hope. We have a heavenly hope that's sure. Our salvation is, is set, that we're reserved in heaven. That word reserved too, I looked it up, means to guard. It means to garrison. It was used of a military garrison, guarding and protecting. Jesus in John 14 said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house were many, what? Mansions. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will do what? Come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And then Jesus not only promised heaven, his Father's house, but he prayed in John 17 and he said, Father, I will that those whom thou hast given me be with me, that they may behold my glory, the glory that I have with you before the world ever was. He said, I want to have them in heaven with me. And I believe that the Father will answer that prayer. Now, when does the believer go to heaven? Well, you have two options. Either you get raptured, and you go to meet the Lord in the air in the rapture, those who are alive remain translated, or you're resurrected. You'll already be in heaven waiting for your body to be resurrected, and there we will forever be with the Lord. Now, what about heaven does it say here, verse 4? Heaven is our inheritance, is incorruptible, heaven is undefiled, heaven will never fade away. Notice, it's incorruptible. It means it won't decay, it won't, uh, it's actually death proof, it won't decay. Undefiled means it won't tarnish or stain or dim. Can you imagine when we've been there 10,000 years bright shining as the sun? Then it started to dim a little bit. We notice that the streets of gold are turning now to asphalt and there's cracks in the road. And you go, I can't believe it. I was on my way to the mansion the other day and somebody graffitied it. <laughs> the gold starting to tarnish. Or the light's starting to dim. It won't happen. I love that, that stands in John Newton's Amazing Grace when we've been there 10,000 years. Bright shining as the sun. It'll never dim or weaken. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Praise God. That's for you. That's for me. All of this is intended to encourage suffering Christians. When the outlook is bad, try the uplook. You have a reservation in heaven. And then he says, will not fade away. Verse 4 means it can never suffer variations in value, glory, or beauty. It's time proof. Praise the Lord. And then thirdly, we have in verse 5, a secure hope. Look at verse 5. We are kept by the power of God. 
What is keeping us for heaven? God is, by his own power, verse 5. Through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. This is when the Christ comes back in his majesty, in his power, and his glory of the second coming. So our hope is secure. We're kept by the power of God. Jude, verse 24, says, Unto him that is able to do what? Keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, every Christian should memorize Romans 8, 1, says there's now, therefore, no what? Condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. That's where that verse stops. If you're a Christian, you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, no condemnation. Now write down Romans 8, verse 30, where Paul says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. I love what John, I think it's John, John, John Wesley, John Newton, used to say, what begins with grace, it's Jonathan Edwards, forgive me. Jonathan Edwards said, what begins with grace ends in glory. I know you've heard me quote that a million times. I start quoting it enough and I don't give credit to its source, Jonathan Edwards. But Jonathan Edwards said, what begins with grace ends in glory. You're saved by grace. You're headed for glory. Amen? And this is all to encourage us. What a blessing. Now, I just want to give you a sneak peek at one more verse as we wrap up. Wherein, in light of what he just said, we greatly rejoice. Though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through the manifold temptations, trials, or testings. Let's pray.